Hello and welcome to North Star Oasis. I'm your host, Jeff Williams. We're here for another jam-packed, action-filled information overload just for you. Uh, you know, we have 228 shopping days left until Christmas. So I guess now is the time we got to start putting together that mental Christmas list. And actually, this week I figured out one thing that is vital on my Christmas list. Uh, last couple of days I've woken up with... Uh, severe neck strain and I figured out yesterday that my pillow at home is so flat that I don't get stability on my neck and so as a result I wake up literally with a pain in the neck which leads to a headache and then I'm kind of out of sync for the day. So I have asked my producer uh, Dallas Pearson that if he is planning on getting me a Christmas present this year it has to be a my pillow because I just need to get some stability to my head so I can focus, I can do show prep and everything else. And, you know, voila, I mean, we'll really be fully in sync. So 228 shopping days left until Christmas. <laughs> yeah, and he's saying I'm so cranky right now that he might actually give it to me early. Hey, that would be nice. Uh, but with that, uh, we do have an incredible show for you today. Of course, incredible by our standards means top-notch. Uh, we really put a lot of work and detail in to give you kind of a, as we always try to do on this show, give you a little bit more than that surface look at what is going on in the news. So to start things off, we're going to take a look back at an important man who saved the free world. No, I am not talking about Ronald Reagan and tear down this wall. We're going back further than that. No, I am not talking about Abraham Lincoln and the Emancipation Proclamation. We're not going back that far. We're going to go starting off in 1940 with Winston Churchill. Here's our Prager University segment for today. In May 1940, Adolf Hitler and his Nazi war machine were sweeping across the European continent. The future of the free world hung in the balance. An isolationist-leaning United States was an ocean away. There was one man who stood between Hitler's seemingly invincible army and crushing defeat. That one man was Winston Churchill. He was born on November the 30th, 1874. Though we think of him as the quintessential Englishman, he was actually half American. His mother, Jenny, was the daughter of a wealthy New York stock speculator. His father, Lord Randolph Churchill, was of English nobility and a major political figure. From his early school days, Churchill recognised the power of words. Throughout his life, he used them with consummate skill. They never let him down. He first made a name for himself as a war correspondent in the 1890s, covering conflicts in Cuba, northern India, the Sudan and South Africa. Though he never abandoned journalism and became one of the greatest historians of his age, Churchill used his family connections and his own fame to launch himself into politics. His confident manner and matchless oratory marked him as a natural leader. 1914 and World War I found him in the key position of First Lord of the Admiralty, where he did much to modernise Britain's navy. In 1915, Churchill thought he could bring a speedy end to the war by opening a new front in Turkey which he perceived as the weak link in the German alliance against the Allies. This led to the infamous Gallipoli campaign. Badly underestimating the fighting strength of the Turks, thousands of British, Australian and New Zealand soldiers were killed in battles that proved to be every bit as indecisive and bloody as the campaigns on Europe's Western Front. Churchill took the blame. This was perhaps the low point of his life, Dismissed from the War Cabinet, five months later he enlisted in the Army, where he saw action in France. He rose again in British politics throughout the 1920s, making money, as he always did, through his writing and speaking. As Adolf Hitler took power in Germany in the 1930s, Churchill was one of the first, and certainly the loudest voice in England, sounding the alarm. But it was an alarm few in England wanted to hear. The English had been traumatised, as had all of Europe, by the shocking amount of death and destruction of the First World War. No one wanted to face the possibility that it could happen again. 
Churchill, however, saw that a new confrontation with Germany was inevitable. And when the inevitable arrived, with the stunning German attack on France in May 1940, a desperate nation turned to him. He was ready. His weapons were his pen, his voice, and his words. I have nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears, and sweat, he told the House of Commons in his first speech as Prime Minister. Things quickly turned from bad to worse. France collapsed, Belgium surrendered, and a quarter of a million British soldiers barely managed to escape from Dunkirk. Even as the war news moved from dangerous to desperate to disastrous, Churchill never wavered. In speech after speech, he infused the British with the spirit to fight on against Hitler's monstrous tyranny. We shall not flag or fail, he said after Dunkirk. We shall go on to the end. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall never surrender. The point about Churchill in 1940 is not that he stopped a German invasion, but that he stopped the British government making peace. If Churchill had not been Prime Minister, the pro-appeasement Foreign Secretary Lord Halifax would have been. We know that Halifax was open to negotiating with Hitler. We'd be mistaken to assume that the German Führer's terms would not have been reasonable. They probably would have been very reasonable, as Hitler wanted to fight a one-front war against Russia and an agreement with Britain would have allowed him to do just that. Churchill made this impossible. Had he not rallied the British people in the face of defeat after defeat, preventing Hitler from concentrating his full efforts on Russia, the entire history of the free world would have been much different, and undoubtedly much darker. Because of Churchill's efforts and the marvellous resilience of the British people, the United States had an unsinkable aircraft carrier, Britain, from which to mount the liberation of the European continent in June of 1944. For this, and so much more, free people everywhere can thank the greatest man of his age, Winston Churchill. I'm Andrew Roberts for Prager University. Now keep all of that in mind as we go through the rest of what's going on because really I think we have the makings, the potential of seeing another man who is saving the free world. And yes, I am talking about President Donald J. Trump. There are a lot of critics of Trump who want to compare him to Hitler. But really, if you take a look at his actions, and you take a look at his foresight, he might actually become the next Winston Churchill. Let me show you something that happened here. We've, been, we've, we've covered a lot of what's gone on with the North Korea situation. Uh, we got a little bit of wrap-up to do on that, and then we're going to take a look at the next crisis. And that's what today's show is about. Um, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. Mike Pompeo was a former member of Congress from Kansas. He also became the head of the CIA. He is also now the Secretary of State, and he had just returned yesterday from North Korea. And here is, from a couple of days ago, President Trump announcing uh, that the Secretary of State was heading to North Korea. At this very moment, Secretary Pompeo is on his way to North Korea in preparation for my upcoming meeting with Kim Jong-un. Plans are being made. Relationships are building. Hopefully, a deal will happen. And with the help of China, South Korea, and Japan, a future of great prosperity and security can be achieved for everyone. Secretary Pompeo is right now going to North Korea. He will be there very shortly in a matter of virtual, probably an hour. Uh, he's got meetings set up. We have our meetings scheduled. We have our meetings set. The location is picked, the time and date, everything is picked, and we look forward to have a very great success. We think uh, relationships are building with North Korea. We'll see how it all works out. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. But it can be a great thing for North Korea, South Korea, Japan, and the entire world. We hope it all works out. Thank you very much. Are everybody. the Americans being free? Are the Americans being free? We'll all soon be finding out. We will soon be finding out. It would be a great thing if they are. We'll soon be finding out. Thank you very much. What message did you send to North Korea, Mr. President? 
I have to harken back to the 2008 presidential debate between John McCain and Barack Obama when it came to discussing the negotiations with, North, with um, Iran. And John McCain was pressing Barack Obama pretty heavily about preconditions. And Obama said, I'll meet with Ahmadinejad or anybody in Iran. And, you know, it doesn't hurt for us to talk to them. But then McCain kept saying, without preconditions. Well, what does that mean? Without preconditions, meaning that you don't have, without having people in advance to open the doors and pave the way, that's a precondition to negotiations. Don, President Donald Trump is actually a firm believer in preconditions. And that deviates from Barack Obama, who just went around willy-nilly, just trying to open up, you know, trying to force open doors without, I think, fully understanding the diplomatic process. And that's the way that Obama was. That's the way he was. I'm not saying that as a good thing or a bad thing. Um, but with Mike Pompeo going to North Korea, he's trying to finalize all of the deals that this has all been leading up to so we can get a meeting with Kim Jong-un and President Trump. That's what this leads up to. And so Mike Pompeo went to North Korea. That was a precondition. And then right after that, we had three American detainees who were released from North Korea. So let's take a look next at President Trump hailing the release of those three. Right now, flying back are three what they were calling hostages. We call them fine people, three really fine people. Uh, seem to be healthy. Uh, they'll be landing at 2 o'clock in the morning at Andrews Air Force Base. And I'll be there to greet them. Mike will be with me. Uh, it will be, uh, I think, a very special time. because Nobody thought this was going to happen. And if it did, it would be years or decades, frankly. Nobody thought this was going to happen. And I appreciate Kim Jong-un doing this and allowing them to go. We picked a time. We picked a place for the meeting, or summit, as you like to call it. And I think it'll be very successful. But as I always say, who knows? Who knows what's going to happen? But uh, it's going to be a very important event. So we're honored by the fact that the three gentlemen are coming home. And I look forward to seeing you, probably some of you, maybe a lot of you. Uh, it'll be 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh, it'll be quite a scene. And it'll be, to me, it's very exciting because it represents something. It represents something very important to this country. Uh, people never thought a thing like this could happen, and can. People never thought you were going to have a situation where we're having serious and positive communication with North Korea. And we are. What happens, who knows? But we have a chance at something really great for the world, and great for North Korea, and great for everyone. So I want to thank you all for being here, and we will see you at Two o'clock in the morning. Okay, very exciting. Let's go. Make your way up. We're going to announce that in three days. Show. Within three days. We're just working arrangements, but we will be there. It will not be there. No. You deserve the Nobel Prize. Everyone thinks so, but I would never say it. <laughs> you know what I want to do? I want to get it finished. The prize I want is victory for the world, not for even here. I want victory. For the world, because that's what we're talking about. So that's the only prize I want. Could something still scuttle this meeting? The, the summit? Uh, everything can be scuttled. Everything can be scuttled. Doesn't what? mean a lot of things can happen. A lot of good things can happen. A lot of bad things can happen. I believe that we have both sides want to negotiate a deal. I think it's going to be a very successful deal. I think we have a really good shot at making it successful. But lots of things can happen. And, of course, you'll be the first to know about it if it does. But I think we have a really good chance to make a great deal for the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. And since we are taping this on May 10th, that was yesterday's press conference. Uh, that was on May 9th, uh, following, I believe, a cabinet meeting. And if you notice, President Trump says that a lot of things can go wrong in a negotiation, that he's hopeful, he's optimistic. Notice that he's... 
he knows what he's getting into. He also knows that the three Americans who were released, that was a bargaining chip and a goodwill gesture from Kim Jong-un, who also, it appears, wants to negotiate in good faith. You know what? That's a good thing for the world. Whether President Trump gets the Nobel Peace Prize or not, that'll all work its way out in the future. I kind of hope he does. But really, after giving President Obama the Nobel Peace Prize before he actually did anything to promote peace, other than give a few speeches, I don't think that the Nobel Peace Prize has as much value, at least in the minds of the current generation of people around the world, as it once did. But that's another story for another day. Uh, about 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, Eastern Time, uh, the our aircraft arrived at Joint Base Andrews, and um, President Trump welcomed home the three detainees. Let's check it out. people. They are really three incredible people. And the fact that we were able to get them out so soon was some really a tribute to a lot of things, including a certain process that's taking place right now. And that process is very important. So we will see what happens. We have a meeting scheduled in a very short period of time. You'll be hearing about it soon. We have the location set. And we will see if we can do something that people did not think was going to happen for many, many years, and a lot of bad things could have happened in between. So uh, I, I just want to say this is a special night for these three really great people, and congratulations on being in this country. Thank you. So the three detainees are now home. And on that trip, there was an Associated Press reporter, and he actually gives us kind of the inside baseball as to what was going on. This is from his observations, courtesy of the Associated Press. To North Korea and from North Korea back to Washington. Well, it certainly was very intense. It was cloaked in secrecy. You know, we, we, we weren't given an exact time when we were going to leave. We uh, were given, we were basically given only four hours notice on our departure when we left on Monday. Um, once we got there, it was a lot of uh, sitting around waiting, but uh, we knew that something extraordinary was about to happen. Most of the delegation that was with Pompeo didn't see any of this. Um, they, the three detainees were handed over to uh, American officials at a separate hotel from where Secretary Pompeo was. It was not a sure thing. In fact, uh, Secretary Pompeo, even after he met with Kim Jong-un, was not 100% sure that they were, go were going to be released. It wasn't until about uh, 10, 15 minutes after the meeting that an emissary came to his hotel to let him know that the uh, pardons had, in fact, been issued. But he also recognizes that this is only one part of um, a way to get to uh, uh, the gene, uh, one part of the way to improve relations with North Korea and get to the um, ultimate goal uh, of denuclearizing the peninsula. So, yes, he was uh, pleased. He was uh, happy. He thought his meetings with Kim Jong un went well. Uh, he was very happy that he was able to bring back the prisoners, but uh, I think he realizes that there's still a lot of hard work down the down the road. We did not encounter them at all. They were uh, they they were brought onto the plane um, and in uh, see, after we were on, and they were kept in a sequestered in a section of the plane that was uh, that was curtained off. On the side. So that is a little bit more of the inside scoop, just for you. Uh, if you go back just a little bit to the one of the first press conferences that we had played in one of those clips, uh, President Trump did mention that a date and time has been set and we'll know about it within three days. Well, early this morning, it was announced. 
Uh, Kim Jong-un and President Trump will be meeting in Singapore on June 12th. So here is an RT report highlighting that upcoming meeting. On the side of the Atlantic, we now have a date for President Trump's meeting with Kim Jong-un, as we expected we would, but the president tweeting out just a little while ago that it's going to be June 12th. The highly anticipated meeting, he said, between Kim Jong-un and myself will take place in Singapore on June 12th. It's a Tuesday. We will both try to make it a very special moment for world peace. Let's bring in Chief Content Officer Marty Schenker. Marty, this was to be anticipated after the scenes that unfolded at Andrews Air Force Base overnight. Yeah, it's uh, clearly something that Donald Trump was very anxious to get out. He's been teasing that the date and place had already been decided for days, but refused to say when they were. So in his uh, well-followed Twitter account, he announced it, uh, it will be in Singapore just a few minutes ago. Now, Marty, this also comes on the heels of the president pulling out of the Iran deal and really, you know, widespread reaction to that. A lot of tremors here in Washington, D.C. and elsewhere and a lot of schisms, I mean, breaking with age-old allies. How does that color this coming meeting with the North Korea leader? Well, it certainly puts a lot of uh, premium on a positive result out of that meeting. Obviously. Uh, the return of the three hostages from North Korea yesterday, along with this absolute scheduling of the meeting, it sets up high expectations for what comes out of, uh, uh, out of this meeting with Kim on June 12th. It's, a, <clears throat> it's high risk for Donald Trump in a certain way. Uh, he needs to get out of that meeting exactly what he has said his aim is, to denuclearize the <laughs> the peninsula mm -hmm. and in fact that is something he has set up those high expectations himself by putting so much prestige personal prestige in making this happen exactly and you know obviously sort of blowing up all sorts of deals pulling out saying he's going to renegotiate them and, and yet we haven't really seen any particular deal get renegotiated so far many of them perhaps in the process of being negotiated is this just going to be one more or is this something that will get done quite quickly marty it's, it's not like there can be con continued meetings with the north korean leader is there well it's uh, it's a pretty interesting point bonnie because the original uh, deal that Obama struck on uh, uh, on Iran took something like 10 years. Um, the North Korea issue is a is is similarly complicated to in a, allow for verification of any denuclearization program by North Korea. It's not something you can just write down on a piece of paper after a half an hour. There, so they may agree in principle, but it's the devil in the details, and that could take not just weeks, it could take months or even longer. So uh, the key thing for him is to get uh, Kim to agree to abandon all nuclear programs that could lead to uh, a weapon, to give up whatever he has that uh, allows them to explode a nuclear bomb, which they've done a number of times. Well, I'll tell you one thing that President Trump has going for him that Barack Obama didn't, that uh, President Trump does not have John Kerry as the lead negotiator in the deal. And I, John Kerry has the best of intentions. He, for, but for some reason, he just never had the skill sets to really pull off anything good. Perhaps it was because he was a little too nice. And... I, I, I followed Senator and Secretary of State Kerry's career for many, many years. And the one thing I have to say about John Kerry is he's always been a sellout. He's been a traitor. Going back to his 1972 U.S. Senate testimony about alleged um, uh, atrocities committed by U.S. troops in Vietnam, which was proven to be false. And you watch him rise throughout Congress and into the U.S. Senate. And I had a deal with Senator Kerry when I was working with Minnesota Won't Forget POWMIA Incorporated. And he was the chairman of the Senate Select Committee on POWMIA Affairs. And he was a bigger thorn in the side in trying to get a resolution than he was a help. And then I watched him go as, you know, rise to presidential nominee for the Democratic Party. And he completely sold us out. What good is John Kerry? 
honestly, what good is he? And I'm, gonna, I'm laying it on the line because John Kerry is not the person you want to be negotiating with Iran. And that was Barack Obama's biggest failing. I actually have higher credence for Hillary Clinton as a negotiator, as Secretary of State, than I do for John Kerry. And the reason is that that is one skill set that Hillary Clinton actually does have. Now, we've covered before on the show that a lot of the stuff that she's negotiated has benefited her personally, sometimes at the expense of the country, a.k.a. the Uranium One deal. But she at least knows how to negotiate that. And John Kerry it doesn't have this, it's the skill sets. It's not in his wheelhouse. And so when I hear the commentators say, well, you know, it took 10 years for that deal to be made with Iran. Yeah, but look who you had leading the effort for the United States. That has a lot to do with how the deal turned out. Because actually the Iran deal is what we're going to be talking about right now. Because President Trump did announce uh, this last week that, he, that the U.S. will be withdrawing from that nuclear deal. Now let's take a look right now at President Trump's announcement. My fellow Americans, today I want to update the world on our efforts to prevent Iran from acquiring a nuclear weapon. In 2015, the previous administration joined with other nations in a deal regarding Iran's nuclear program. This agreement was known as the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, or JCPOA. In theory, the so-called Iran deal was supposed to protect the United States and our allies from the lunacy of an Iranian nuclear bomb, a weapon that will only endanger the survival of the Iranian regime. In fact, the deal allowed Iran to continue enriching uranium and, over time, reach the brink of a nuclear breakout. The fact is, this was a horrible, one-sided deal that should have never, ever been made. It didn't bring calm, it didn't bring peace, and it never will. I am announcing today that the United States will withdraw from the Iran nuclear deal. America will not be held hostage to nuclear blackmail. We will not allow American cities to be threatened with destruction, and we will not allow a regime the chance death to America to gain access to the most deadly weapons on Earth. Powerful sanctions will go into full effect. If the regime continues its nuclear aspirations, it will have bigger problems than it has ever had before. Thank you. Now, before we start looking at the replies and the critiques of President Trump pulling us out of the uh, JPCOA, or JCPOA, Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, it is not a treaty. It is not an executive agreement. In fact, Julia Freefield, the Assistant Secretary of State for Legislative Affairs under Secretary of State John Kerry, in, uh, on November 19th, 2015, had written in a letter to then-Congressman Mike Pompeo, who is now the Secretary of State, quote, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, JCPOA, is not a treaty or an executive agreement and is not a signed document. Well, if it's not a signed document, what is it? What is, okay, so this is going to be like a voluntary agreement? That's no better than a pair Paris Climate Accord. That was a voluntary agreement. Where is the enforcement? Where is the teeth? Oh, there's an ex there's, um, 
according to the letter, the, there's extensive verification measures. Iran's understanding that we have the capacity to reimpose and ramp up our sanctions if Iran does not meet its agreements. That's in the letter. But the fact is, oh, and uh, one other thing. Uh, the White House website answered the question. This is 2015. Will companies that sign contracts with Iran be able to continue that business even if Iran violates the JCPOA and snapback occurs because of a grandfather clause? The White House answer was, no, there is no grandfather clause in the JCPOA and no exemptions from our sanctions for long-term contracts. But the fact is it is not a treaty. It is not an executive, uh, what was it? Um, Uh, an executive agreement, it is not a signed document, there is no enforcement provision. Iran knows this, and they didn't sign it either. There's no ratification procedures, there is no teeth. And in fact, in August of 2015, President Hassani Rouhani in August, uh, that, that, um, yeah, I just said in August, he had opposed parliamentary approval in Iran because it will, and this is his words here, quote, it will create an obligation for the government. It will mean the president, who has not signed it so far, will have to sign it. Why should we place an unnecessary legal restriction on the Iranian people? This isn't a bad deal. It's no deal. This is no deal at all. Okay, so it's an agreement. I've had agreements with people. I'm going to make up an agreement right now. Hey, Dallas, uh, when we're done with the show, why don't you drive me over to Green Bay and let's go to the Packer Hall of Fame together? Okay, that's our agreement. Now, if Dallas doesn't bring me over to the Packer Hall of Fame in Green Bay after the show, well, he just violated the terms of the agreement. There's no enforcement. I can't do anything about it. And mind you, you know, Dallas kind of looked at me funny like, what? What are you talking about? <laughs> and I know he doesn't like sports too. So, But the fact is, I mean, I, I just threw that, out, you know, threw that together. There's no enforcement. Did Dallas and I have a deal just because I told him we're going to have a deal? No, you know, one can say, well, Ron agreed to the deal. Okay, so Dallas could have said yes. So if, he, you know, if I say, Dallas, take me over here. And he says, okay, and then, now nah, I'm not, not going to do it. He just backed out of a deal, right? Well, what is the enforcement? What kind of redress do I get if he doesn't bring me to where I want to go? None whatsoever. Now, if we would have had a contract, not just a verbal agreement, but a legally binding written signed document, a contract ratified, well, we might have some consequences. But the JCPOA is not that. This is not, I mean, if you go back to just basic contractual law, this is not a legal binding contract. So I'm glad to see President Trump pulled us out of the JCPOA and is reimposing sanctions simply because we didn't even really have a binding deal. So I have to applaud him on this. Now, I wanted to give you that little bit of an explanation because now we're going to take a look at congressional reaction. Listen to members of Congress talking about Trump pulling us out of the deal. As a matter of fact, not just, not just that. we got a couple of other clips that talk about other people, including negotiators, talking about what they think is going to happen and should happen. So let's take a look at Congress's reaction. I think the president's made a mistake. You know, our objective is to make sure Iran never has a nuclear weapon and to take action against their non-nuclear violations uh, with cooperation of our European partners. And withdrawing from the nuclear agreement isolates America. I think it helps Iran uh, and works against our objectives to, to control their type of activities. They knew what was coming. Our allies have known for months. And, but here's the bottom line. The president, I campaigned for president and for Senate on the promise of getting rid of this deal. He won on the same promise. He was elected to do this. This is what he said he was going to do. I don't know why it surprises people that someone runs for president, gets elected on the promise of uh, getting rid of the Iran deal and then gets rid of it. You know, I, I think that the, the agreement obviously had problems, uh, didn't address Iran's malign behavior or ballistic missiles, but after you're in it and after Iran has already realized the benefits of it, which we front loaded, to now allow them to get out of their obligations on the nuclear side would be foolhardy, in my view. This is a truly disappointing development. I think President Trump makes us 
uh, less safe, less secure by weakening our bonds with our European allies, uh, with whom we crafted uh, a deal that stopped the advance of the Iranian nuclear weapons program. Um, I've got a couple of questions for the President. Um, after this, um, how will we gain North Korea's confidence in any future agreement, uh, and how will we gain the confidence of our partners in the JCPOA, the Iran deal, uh, China and Russia, Germany, and France and the UK, um, that we will have uh, the inclination to stick with any future deal? Um, I don't think it makes us any safer. I didn't see the President's comments yet. In general, I felt that the agreement negotiated by the Obama administration and other parties w was flawed because it did not uh, pertain to ballistic missiles and it essentially gave sanctions relief without taking away the ability of the Iranians to ultimately build a nuclear weapon. Nevertheless, I would have preferred a course of action where the president worked with our allies to fix those flaws. The most. Okay, Senator Christopher Coons, what did you say in the previous six months regarding President Trump's handling of North Korea? Before you have questions about him as to how this is going to keep Americans safe and how this is going to impact the North Korean deal, what did you say about President Trump's handling of North Korea? The answer is that he was thinking that this is going to lead us down the path to nuclear war. So I don't take anything that Senator Chris Coons has uh, with any type of credence. Um, I have to say that Senator Collins actually makes a good point. Uh, that yes, perhaps this should have been handled a little bit different with our diplomatic partners in the matter. Okay, I'll give her that one. I agree with, with Senator Marco Rubio. Senator Rubio, hey, the guy campaigned for president. He said he was going to do this, so he did it. Why is everybody alarmed by it? That's exactly it. We've seen this coming for two years. Should anybody really be surprised that this is going to happen? But that's our congressional delegation. Now, another thing to answer Senator Coons. I'm going to answer on the president's behalf, Senator Coons. How is this going to help the U.S. stand with negotiations with North Korea? North Korea knows how Iran is feeling because they felt that brunt. They also know that President Trump would, uh, would, uh, would fully intend to back up his statement on Iran. This tells North Korea that President Trump is pretty serious. I think this strengthens the president's hand in negotiations. So that's how it's going to keep us safe. And Iran only has to take a look at North Korea to see what the outcome is going to be. And I hope they do that. So that is our congressional uh, uh, um, response to this. Now, there's a former negotiator who does fear a ripple effect to the Iran move. Now, I wish that same negotiator would have taken a look at how President Trump handled North Korea, because that's a template. Let's take a look. The most you know, uh, realistic but also concerning scenario is Iran decides not that it's going to rush to a bomb, but that it's going to start creeping up its nuclear program in ways that it had promised to either freeze or even walk back as a result of the deal, in which it has walked back. So they start enriching at higher levels. They start enriching more. They start testing uh, advanced uh, centrifuges. They do the kinds of things that were the source of preoccupation which led to the deal in the first place. Then what, pres what, what does President Trump do? Does he try to renegotiate with Iran? Iran will say, no, thank you. We had a deal. Does he take military action, as he's hinted, that he will not let Iran restart some of its nuclear programs? And of course, the cycle of war in, in Iran, with so much at stake, uh, that's the disaster scenario that has to be avoided. In an asymmetric response to our walking away from the deal, Iran could decide, OK, we're not going to respond on the nuclear file, but look at what's going to happen in Syria, look what's going to happen in Iraq, look what's going to uh, gonna happen in the Gulf. And those steps could very quickly escalate into a military confrontation. So when you add up the nuclear deal, the lack of trust, the lack of diplomacy, the fact that U.S. and Iranian armed forces are close to each other in several theaters, the odds of war simply go up, and for no good reason. 
you know, there's going to be ripple effects to a decision by the Trump administration to walk away from a deal, some that we're not even, we can't even predict about how much people are going to trust the United States, what it's going to do to European and American cooperation in other theaters. So it's, it's hard to see any silver lining to this. Clearly, it's not going to help transatlantic relations between Europe and, and, and the United States. But what happens in North Korea? I mean, you, you have uh, you on the verge of a very important meeting between President Trump and, and, and uh, the North Korean leader, Kim Jong-un, about a nuclear deal. If you're sitting in Pyongyang and you see what just happened and you see that President Trump has ripped up a deal that was just uh, in entered into by his predecessor, does this make them particularly willing to, uh, to enter a deal? When they see that we're not we're talking about regime change in Iran, does it convince Pyongyang we should hold on to our nuclear weapon as an insurance against regime change, or does it convince them to give it up? I think the answer is self-evident. Now here's what's self-evident. Robert Malley, he was the US, lead U.S. negotiator in 2015 on the Iran nuclear deal. Of course he doesn't want to see the, his work done, you know, undone. So I blame him. He also had been in discussions with Hamas, listed by the U.S. State Department as a terrorist organization. This was uh, prior to 2008. You know, he's, not, he's a smart guy. He's a very, very, very smart guy. I have to give him credit for that. Uh, he did manage to serve the Clinton administration as Director for Democracy, Human Rights, and Humanitarian Affairs of the National Security Council. He um, helped coordinate refugee policy and efforts to promote democracy and human rights abroad and U.S. policy towards Cuba. I don't necessarily know he was successful there, but that's, again, another subject for another de debate. Uh, he was the Special Assistant to President Clinton for Arab-Israeli Affairs. Um, he became program director for the um, Center for Middle East Peace and Economic Development in Washington, D.C. Uh, he was the director for Middle East and uh, North Africa at the International Crisis Group, where he is now as the CEO. The guy knows his stuff. So in certain respects that he is correct, and this could lead to this chain of reactions, except the thing that he forgets is that you're dealing with Donald Trump, you're not dealing with your former boss, John Kerry. You're dealing with Mike Pompeo. You're dealing with a whole different team that looks at the world completely different than Robert Malley, Barack Obama, Bill Clinton. And that hasn't been into his analysis. That negotiations are a little bit different style than what he's used to. He also hasn't accounted for James Mattis as the Secretary of Defense. Mattis also knows his stuff and has been in the region for many, many, many years. So I don't necessarily have the same type of fears of a ripple effect. I understand Mally's frustrations, and they're legitimate. But now let's take a look at the Iranian communities in the United States. And I know some people from Iran who are here in Minnesota and great people. A couple of them I can actually say are friends of mine. Uh, not just mere acquaintances. But there is some fear and some concern, and this is legitimate, uh, but we're going to hear from some, a uh, couple of Iranian uh, immigrants. I understand that the president, the POTUS, wants to, wants to represent the American uh, interest here. And if this deal was against or opposed to the short-term or long-term interest of the United States, I would give, like, you know, I would understand him if he wanted to withdraw. But the fact is that this deal was not opposing in any way uh, to the interests of the United States. I could understand uh, President Trump's uh, apprehension of the time about the deal and many other concerns, immigration, illegal immigration. As an immigrant, I've always been a fan of uh, you know, optimizing the immigration policies con continuously because the world is dynamic and changing, so should be the uh, immigration policy. So I'm not like, I'm not blindly without any factual basis denying everything that the president has said. But about the deal, he, he would make some 
very general and at times rogue remarks to be, uh, uh, to be frank with you. So he, was, he has said continuously that this is a bad denial in a very general term without giving us any reasons or specifics. Chaos, fear is the dominant feeling. Now, it's, I know it's not the end of the world. It's, it's just a failed agreement, you know. It's, it, the the, the, the uh, consequences apparently will be most uh, more catastrophic for Iranian people than for American people. Well, it's, it's a very uh, weird political climate over there because what, what's happening is uh, the hardliners are going to just attack the reformists that were trying to meet with Americans to, to kind of meet in the middle and this is just making it so that's not possible. You're, you're, you're making negotiations, or they're pulling out is making negotiations super hard. Uh, he's missing out on Well, both of them have some extremely valid points. And it's something to keep in mind as we take a look forward. Uh, but now, as we've just seen with uh, detainees from North Korea being released, there is uh, there are a couple of families. And we're going to take a look at one right now. Uh, who hope that they can get their loved ones back who are detained in Iran. And the first one is uh, Robert Levinson. And uh, Levinson, just pulling up, uh, he um, is a former Drug Enforcement Administration and uh, FBI agent who disappeared mysteriously uh, on uh, Kush Island in Iran in 2007. And he is believed to be, uh, it was March 9th, 2007, and he was researching an alleged cigarette smuggling case. And it is believed that he was arrested by Iranian intelligence officials to be interrogated and used as a bargaining chip in negotiations with Washington. Now again, if the JCPOA would have been successful, then perhaps Bob Levinson would have been home by now, but Levinson wasn't obviously terms of, the, of that deal. Um, that's again a failure of uh, the previous administration. So um, Levinson's family is concerned that he hasn't been around, and he's been gone for 11 years, one month, and 27 days. So let's take a look at what the Levinson family has to say. Uh, he's missing out on a ton of celebrations. He has he has new grandchildren every uh, year, every couple of years that he's just not meeting, and that he hasn't had the opportunity to um, experience that pride that he's feeling in this picture of finally being able to hold a grandchild in his arms, and that we do hope that this um, initiates and what it sparks is a renewed conversation about Bob Levinson and that in the future uh, with any negotiation between Iran and the United States that he becomes a priority and is at the forefront of any discussions. He has never met my son nor does he know that I'm, I'm married. Um, uh, he has no idea that um, his namesake uh, Bobby Booth who is my sister's son had cancer uh, a couple of years ago um, was able to overcome that cancer um, he has no idea that my son Nate just started walking and can say uh, several words, including mama and dada now. Um, he's never met any of these uh, grandchildren except for one, and um, our heart breaks every day because we know how desperately he wants to get back home and, and see his family again. Uh, my father is the greatest person I've ever known, and um, uh, my influence in life, he's my mentor, my best friend. Um, Without him, it has been a struggle for myself, my brothers and sisters, my mom for the past 11 years. Um, every day I try to act as if um, he's there guiding me. I try to think about what my dad would do in, in tough situations. I think about his advice. I think about what he would say if he was back home. And um, I so desperately want him to be safe, for him to re be returned home for him to just live out the rest of his life in peace, surrounded by his family. Uh, Any time that the United States and Iran are, are talking, uh, it's an opportunity for my pro father's case to be uh, at the forefront of the conversation, and hopefully um, there can be a resolution to bring him home. About a, a quarter of their marriage has been spent with him in captivity. Um, this is my father with Ryan, his first grandson, um, the only one he's been able to meet. This is my father sitting um, outside. Uh, and we'll take a look in just a little bit about the other uh, families who are sharing the same fears and concerns over their loved ones. But we're going to take a look right now at the reaction from Iranian lawmakers to the announcement that President Trump made about the Iran nuclear deal.
پادشم نمیذاره We'll see how we now, do. I personally would like to see some enterprising member of Congress to take a paper Iranian flag to the front of the uh, chamber in the U.S. House of Representatives and lead the cheer death to Iran and burn an Iranian flag and let the Iranians get a taste of their own medicine of what they've been dishing out in the PR battle for the last 40 years. But that's just me. Um, now, President Trump has defended his decision to withdraw from the nuclear deal. Let's take a look at what he had to say. We'll see how we do with Iran. Probably we won't do very well with them, but that's okay, too. Uh, they've got to understand life because I don't think they do understand life. If you look at what's happening in the Middle East with Syria, with Yemen, with all of the places they're involved, it's bedlam and death, and we can't allow that to happen. So we have terminated a terrible, terrible deal that should have never, ever been made. And we will be putting on among the strongest sanctions that we've ever put on a country. And they're going into effect very shortly. They're mostly constituted and drawn already. And we'll just have to see what happens. But we can't allow a deal to hurt the world. That's a deal to hurt the world. That's not a deal for the United States. That's a deal to hurt the world. And so we're going to make either a, a really good deal for the world, or we're not going to make a deal at all. And Iran will come back and say, we don't want to negotiate. And of course, they're going to say that. And if I were their position, I'd say that, too, for the first couple of months. We're not going to negotiate, but they'll negotiate. Or something will happen. Uh, and hopefully, that won't be the case. But I don't think they should do that. I would advise Iran not to start their nuclear program. I would advise them very strongly. If they do, there will be very severe consequence. OK? Thank you very much. And you heard it directly from President Trump's lips. Same thing he told North Korea. North Korea listened. Now we'll see if Iran does. Uh, I don't think Iran is in the same position uh, economically that it was 40 years ago. We're going to find out how this unfolds. Now we're going to take a quick look while we have a little bit of time. There is another, uh, the wife of another Iranian detainee who is hoping for, her uh, for his release. Uh, this is uh, Ziyu Wang. He is um, from China. He's a naturalized American citizen, student at uh, Princeton, who was in Iran working on his doctoral thesis or doctoral dissertation when he was unjustly detained and then he was sentenced to 10 years in prison. So there's no doubt that uh, the five or so detainees in Iran are going to be a subject of this negotiation. Uh, he was detained on August 7, 2016. Uh, he was sentenced to uh, 10 years on ISPNR. He's doing badly there. Um, he had 18 days of uh, solitary, con solitary confinement, and then he spent over a year in the political section of the prison. Um, he's currently living in a half underground, uh, very crowded and ha badly infected, uh, a place badly infected with uh, bed bugs. And his um, health is weakening since he was um, uh, detention. Um, he, he has a lot of um, illnesses. I have great concern about his mental status. He's in depression. He went on two hunger strikes. Okay. He is very, he, he terribly wanted to come home. Sometimes I'm really emotionally unstable. I feel very, very sad. I don't want him to, to give me a phone call and hear me cry on the phone. 
because there's nothing he can do behind the bars to help him. But he feels so helpless and he really wants to help me to improve my situation. I feel so happy for the families of Americans detained in North Korea. I feel so happy for him. I hope our government can do the same for my husband. I'm glad to, to, to see that President Trump um, sent a message to the world that Iran must um, stop uh, its unjust detention of um, foreigners, including Americans. Um, I hope this could be a moving point, uh, um, a needle to move this uh, situation. So now, you know, again, for her, for her sake and for his, I really hope that we can see a long and lasting peace. Uh, we can see them come home. Right now, we know that they're bargaining chips. You know, when I was eight years old, Iran held 52 Americans hostage as a bargaining chip. That was the Jimmy Carter legacy. We lost American service members in April of 1980 in a failed mission to rescue them in Iran. That was called Desert One, or Operation Eagle Claw. Uh, I actually had been to the staging base at Masira Island, Oman, and there was a monument there erected in the honor and memory of the crew that was lost. Of course, we hope that this never comes to that. We see what's happening in North Korea we see the diplomatic efforts that are trying to achieve the aims of uh, having a long and lasting peace and uh, denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Right now, President Trump is setting his sights on Iran, and there's no doubt that he's going to press Iran for the same type of deal that he's pushing for North Korea. We're going to see if he's successful. Yeah, could we have war with Iran? Yeah, we could. We could have had war with North Korea, but I really don't think it's going to come to that. I think what we're going to see is a peace, on, peace in our time, but it's not going to come from a Neville Chamberlain type paper agreement. That was the John Kerry agreement. I think we're going to come with a leader who is going to be remembered in history if he is successful, and that's the key, if he is successful. We are, going to, we are living in an era with a president who in the world of foreign affairs is more molded like the next Winston Churchill. I've long since said that President Trump is a pragmatist. He's not a conservative. He's not a liberal or progressive. He's middle of the road. He sees a problem and he dispatches the resources necessary to solve that problem. That's been the way he has been his entire life. Why don't we just accept the fact that we have somebody who is an American president looking out for America and the world who's taking on the tough problems. These problems weren't created overnight, but there's no doubt in my mind that these problems are going to get resolved. And President Trump just might be the next Winston Churchill in order to lead us there. But that's it for now. I'm your host, Jeff Williams, for Dallas Pearson Producer, reminding you there's 228 shopping days left until Christmas. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.